<clears throat> in your bulletin, I think the first thing it says underneath the title should be the words culture conflict. Uh, boy, is that ever true today. There is a cultural conflict going on in our country uh, regarding Christian things and virtually everything else that's opposed to Christian things. But here's something that may or may not be comforting, good news to you. That conflict's as old as from the time of Adam and Eve. Uh, it's all about wanting our rights, even when it's not right to do. That was the appeal for Adam and Eve. Uh, they were told by Satan that you could be just like God. In every way you could be like God. So go ahead, sin. You can have knowledge. I mean, they had all kinds of things in the garden. But you can have experiential knowledge. You will experience and know the difference between good and bad. You'll be just like God. You deserve this. <clears throat> in our country, this last week on Thursday, uh, I'm sure you were very much involved in celebrations of the 150th anniversary of the surrender at Appomattox. That great day when Robert E. Lee very stately rode his horse down that little trail to meet with Ulysses S. Grant and to surrender um, the war between families. The Civil War, in my opinion, had a basis as to why it happened. And I think it was about rights, personal rights, versus what is right. And I still think that's not been settled in our country. The one group would say, but we have a right to this slavery institution. We have a right to do this, and uh, we purchased them, we, we did all this. And the other group was saying, but they're not being treated right. And there are things wrong about that. And, and it was huge. The entire country split and warred over it. And I don't think we settled it back then. By the way, this coming Tuesday is the 150th anniversary of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. So um, something to contemplate that day. Another one of our great and, and eventually godly leaders. I think we're still in the same argument today. Rights versus what's right. Take an issue, the abortion issue. You know, some say, it's my body, I have a right. And the others say, but you got to do what's right. There's more than just your body involved here. There's another person. The homosexual marriage thing. I have a right to do whatever I want. Uh, I can choose. You know, you don't tell me who to love and who not to love. And, uh, and others are saying, but wait a minute. God has a program, and there is a right way and a wrong way. That, that issue always amazes me. I don't want to get off too much on that, but uh, because I want to get in trouble. But uh, when I grew up, it was nowhere near the mentality of today. And I won't share with you what back then. And, and I wonder, where did that come from? I've seen statistics. If, you, if I were to ask you to write down a number right now, what percentage of the population you think is homosexual, um, the statistics I've seen range from 3.8% to 8 point something percent. I would have thought it was 40, 50%, the way that our culture acts. Another statistic that a, um, a counselor gave this week, which I thought was interesting and sad, is that the homosexual community has 40% suicide rate. Probably not a good one to, to boast about. It's not as strong when I come to the Bible and look at that whole argument about rights versus what is right. But we kind of have a little bit of a conflict here in a tiny little letter that's called Philemon, that postcard that Paul sent to Philemon. And I don't remember if I said it earlier, but basically those four letters that I'm looking at, I kind of, I didn't use the word postcard. I wish John would have told me that sooner. But um, I was thinking in terms of small letters with big messages. Because this one has a gigantic message that needs to be there. It's not as strong as in our culture, that conflict that Philemon was about to face. But Paul was confronting a cultural issue that needed to be faced with all the Christian grace that it could be. 
It was the issue of personal rights, Philemon has his rights, versus doing what is right. Philemon, maybe you don't know much about him, that's possible, has one little letter that was written to him directly. It's a very personal letter. I, I don't have the count in my head, but I think there's 18 verses in this little letter where the first person singular, you, was written. That means Paul is talking to you, Philemon. He's talking to you. This is a very personal letter. Yet, uh, for one reason or another, and I think there's great reasons, this letter gets circulated around all the early churches and incorporated into Scripture because it's wonderful, wonderful stuff that we need to know. Philemon was a Christian leader in a town of Colossae or maybe just outside of Colossae. He was a very well-to-do individual, and he uh, was very, very significant in the Christian movement there. He actually housed a church house uh, in his home. Uh, believers would come to his house to gather together uh, and to worship and to honor Jesus. He was well enough to do that he was a slave owner. Uh, in the Roman Empire, they had slavery. That was something that went on. I don't know how much he had. I don't know anything about that. I do know that there were some estates in that time frame that were well enough that they had as many as 10 to 20,000 slaves working for them. It was a big, big thing. You're going to have real trouble if you start searching the scriptures to find specific statements that condemn slavery. Because I don't think they're there. They're not there. However, the scriptures always promotes the dignity of human life and human people. There were Old Testament laws that Philemon would have been bound by. Um, laws such as um, the sabbatical year law. If a Jew went into slavery to another Jewish person, every seven years, all those debts were forgiven and they were all restored. That was something God set up so that he could keep families and, and economies and all kinds of things going very, very well. Gentiles were protected too by the Old Testament law. You were not allowed to beat and punish physically your slaves. If you did, you would be fined and possibly arrested. You could not treat them unfairly. There were all kinds of laws against it to protect them. God made very certain that he protected people. We're not going to look at all the introduction to the letter of Philemon. We're not going to look at all the conclusion of it. We want to look at the body of what's being discussed here. And in verses 8 through 8 and 9, uh, we'll see that Paul's going to give a plea to Philemon. He says, therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on a basis of love, I then, as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and he will make his appeal. Paul's making this plea based on his relationship and his love with um, Philemon. He could have gone, I'm an apostle, I, I'm one of the key people in this movement, but he didn't go to the authority card. He did mention that he's going to be bold, he's going to tell Philemon exactly what he wants him to do, and he's doing this, he says, as an old man. He uses age. Some people think that that could be translated to mean as an ambassador, which is possibly true, but I think he's really pointing to the age thing here. And most likely, a lot of scholars think that Paul was only about, he was really young, only 55 or so at that time. And Philemon would have been probably close to his age as well. But it could be that when he's talking about his age, he may be talking about the experiences that he has gone through. And many of you have studied and read some of the experiences that Paul had gone through with imprisonments and shipwrecks and all kinds of things he would then be saying, um, I am wise with those years. Uh, I have seen God's handiwork. I have been around and, and I know what, what God wants to do. And then he takes another 
uh, step of credibility when he says, I'm also a prisoner for Jesus Christ. Paul was at this time when he wrote this sitting in a house or a home prison, a house prison in um, Rome. He was under house arrest. And he says, he doesn't say that, boy, I'm shackled by the Roman government here. He says, I'm actually a prisoner for Jesus Christ. I have been commissioned by Jesus to go through this experience in my life. He might joke with us and say, I'm starting a prison ministry. Uh, I'm, I'm a missionary to, to the prison here in Rome. Verses 10 and 11 tells us about the issue that's really at hand. He says, I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. See, Paul met this nice woman, and they had a baby, and they kicked her. No, that's not what happened. <laughs> Onesimus wasn't, this isn't a 20-year letter. Um, what we believe happened was Onesimus, who is a slave owned by Philemon, came and visited Paul in prison, and Paul probably led him to Christ as Savior. He said, he became my son, and literally, the, the emphasis in there would be just like saying, he became my own son. He is as dear to me as anybody else I've ever had. He has a very special relationship between Paul and Onesimus. And most people absolutely believe that Paul had won him to Christ. However, Onesimus apparently was a trusted slave owned by Philemon. What apparently has happened is somehow, in some way, we don't know all the particulars, but he somehow escaped Philemon's care, and with some funds, he found his way to Rome. Now, the name Onesimus is an interesting one. It's a very common name that a lot of slaves had, which then makes some people think that, well, maybe Paul's just talking in general, but there's no way that's what he's doing in this particular letter. The grammar is just way too strong to argue that. This person, Onesimus, his name literally means useful or profitable. And that's a nice thing to have. You're going to have somebody employed for you. By the way, it, their Roman Empire slavery was so well developed, it's not real far away from our employment system. I know. You work at a place, you know you're a slave. And, uh, and maybe you've been treated that way at times in our country that's happened before. But he was, Philemon was, or Nesimus was a slave to Philemon. And, and somehow he gets away from that. He goes away, he leaves. I assume he had some measure of funds to help him for a little while. But while he's in Rome, somehow, maybe the funds ran out. But for some reason... He ventures to go visit Paul while Paul's in house arrest. I assume that he's unable to care for himself. He's getting desperate. He doesn't know what to do. He hears about Paul being arrested. Maybe he overheard a crowd um, gossiping about that. But for whatever reason, um, <clears throat> he, uh, he went to visit Paul. Now some way, and, and this is pretty, pretty obvious, he would have known who Paul was because Paul would have been a friend of Philemon and probably visited uh, the home there on occasion. And so he probably, whether he had a close relationship, whether he even ever had a conversation with Paul, we don't know. But somehow he knew enough to know that Paul was a good person to go and talk to. You're in trouble, you're going to go to anybody you think that will help you. A Christian's ministry is going to follow him no matter where he goes. It's amazing how um, when, when you're just out there doing what God wants you to do, how he will bring people to you and, and people that you can help and can meet the need, even if you're, just, if you're just sensitive to God to let him do that. They may have never conversed before, 
But somehow Onesimus saw something in Paul, whether it's his kindness, whether it was his intelligence, probably his spiritual depth. Somehow he saw something in Paul that told him, if I go to him, he'll help me. He will help me. <clears throat> so he did. And that possibly could have endangered him a little bit because here is a prisoner of the state of Rome. And by association, maybe Onesimus is going to be in trouble. Maybe Onesimus was so desperate that he thought, well, if they arrested me, that's good news. Now I've got a place to sleep. I don't know. I don't know what he was I don't think that's the case. But somehow, through all these visits, Onesimus finds freedom in Jesus Christ. Freedom from sin. Freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, a freedom that is equal to eternity. Now comes the sticky part. Now that you're saved, Onesimus, we got to do something about your relationship with Philemon. Restoration. That's big. In God's eyes, that's really, really big. Restoring relationships and making things right and getting things the way they should be. It's going to be difficult if Onesimus goes into the presence of Philemon again. By Roman law, Philemon could do several things. He could have him imprisoned. Or he could just have his own people beat him to some degree if he wants to. That's the Roman law, not the Jewish Old Testament. Or he could even have him put to death if he wants to. So, Onesimus, do you really want to take this chance? You know, do you really want to go back into the presence of Philemon and test this? So now Onesimus is waiting to see what's going to be his fate. In verse 11, it says that he formerly was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. Remember, Onesimus, the name means useful, profitable. And Paul's taken a pun out of that, and he says, this person, this profitable one, became unprofitable to you, but now he's found Christ, so he's profitable to me and to you at this point. We're not sure why he was unprofitable. Obviously, whatever amount of time he was away from Colossae, he was not serving like he was supposed to be. Somebody's got to fill the gap, and so that probably hurt some. It is possible because pilfering was a, a common thing that if he had any responsibility where he was in touch with the finances of the operation, it's possible he could have taken a little bit of money, put it aside, and then made his run and had enough to sustain him for a little while. We don't know what all the case was, but we do know now that Paul believes him to be very, very profitable. Now that he's in Christ, he is useful to both Paul and Philemon. Scriptures tell us that, and this was written to the church in Colossae, so it's possible this is even the, the group that, well, we know it's the group that Philemon's attached to. Paul said, whatever you do, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. You can make the argument and say, well, my boss is a jerk, my job stinks, but still, you're a Christian. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Not because of your boss or because of the paycheck or because of any other reason like that. You're doing it because you're working for the Lord. Not for men, since you know that you're going to receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Nice that they give you a paycheck. That is good. But what you're doing in the spirit of Christ it's going to get you greater, greater rewards in the future someday. A gentleman named James Denny once said this, that Christianity is the power which can make bad people do it. I'm not sure, now that I read that again, I'm wondering if I left out the word, because if he didn't say it, I would put it in. I would say Christianity is the only power which can make bad people do it. Because I've seen a lot of things try to do that, but very unsuccessful. It's only in Christ that we can succeed. But we need a fuller explanation. So let's look at verses 12 through 6. Paul says, I'm sending him who is my very heart. 
back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. Wow. Paul's really laying it on here. <clears throat> it's not easy to part with this disciple. He's been here coming and meeting with me, and we've been discussing the merits of Christ and the scriptures, and, and boy, it's just to see him eat it up and, and to grow, it's just filled my heart with joy as I'm sitting here with guards around me and chains on me, and yet there's, there's life, there's newness, there's salvation, and there's growth. It's so exciting. And Onesimus was doing something that we wish Philemon and all the other brothers and sisters were doing. They were ministering to Paul. Paul said he took your place. He literally was a substitution for you. Philemon, you should be here. You know me really well. You should be here ministering to me. But you're not. But God sent Onesimus to me. Now Paul wanted to do everything properly. He knew the verses that he wrote in Colossians 3. He wanted to do it all right. He said so. He said, I wouldn't do this without your consent. He could have. He could have said, hey, I'm an apostle. You're not here. I'm keeping this guy. He's good for me. But he would not retain... Onesimus without Philemon's full knowledge and his blessing. But he indicates here that God has a purpose in this too. Kind of interesting. God works circumstances together always. Your circumstances, my circumstances. He does it. He brings them together to bring glory to him and for the good of those who are willing to submit to Jesus Christ. That's what God does. If I'm willing to put my heart out there and open my spirit up to God and allow Him to work in my life, then those horrible things that happen in life, the good things that happen in life, all those circumstances, He can bring them together for good for me, but for glory for Him. Maybe, maybe it was so that Onesimus would just be a better servant. That'd be nice if he could just do his job better. And maybe... He, Maybe he'll get a job in Rome or do something like that. That's a possibility. But maybe it was so that he can serve you, Philemon, for good. He's been serving you all these years, whatever amount of time he's been there. He's been doing this for you, but now he's got a higher calling, a higher motivation, a higher uh, desire. He's going to be a super good servant for you now. <clears throat> maybe it's so that as he returns to you, he's not just a mere slave, but now he's way more than that. He's a brother in Christ. I think the words literally there said that uh, he was parted from you. Interesting, the grammar there, it was, it's a passive thing. He was separated away from you. He didn't, it's, Paul did not say, oh, he ran away from you. It was as if God drove him away. So even what may have been uh, unethical, illegal, Paul's saying, but God was in this to the point that, yeah, this was a bad thing, he shouldn't have done this, but God was a part of this. He had a purpose. God could overcome anything. God had a direct hand in this, or at least oversaw it. And now he's a beloved brother for you. What a wonderful thing. So Paul makes his request, verse 17, so if you consider me a partner, and you better, because I helped you a lot, finally, man. welcome him as you would welcome me. That's what Paul's looking for. So I sent this guy back. Now, you know, this is kind of interesting, too. We have lots of real reason to believe that Paul wrote this letter, we'll talk about that in a moment, and handed it to Onesimus and said, here, go give this to Philemon. It's very probable that Onesimus physically went back to Colossae to be there and 
and to give it. I'm hoping, this is my hope, I wasn't there, I don't know, I don't have video of this, but I'm hoping that he kind of gave it to somebody and stood outside to wait and see what the answer would be. I'm hoping that he didn't go in and say, oh, I mean, I've seen you there, here's this letter, please read it before you hit me. I hope he didn't do that. I hope he was outside and, and was anxiously waiting to see what was come. I don't know that Philemon even, or Onesimus even had a chance to read the letter before he handed it off for Onesimus to get. I don't know. Paul's request was just simply, accept him as you would me. I am your beloved brother, and accept him as if it was me coming to you. Now here's the offer he makes in verses 18 through 21. Paul says, if he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention, by the way, Philemon, you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than what I asked. Interesting. If, if he's done anything, if he owes you, there's, there's nothing iffy about this. He left his responsibilities. He abandoned what he was doing and he took off to Rome. I suggest that it's not known, but I still think he probably took a few shekels with him when he went. And, um, you know, it's very possible. If he owes you anything, if he's um, faulted you in any sense, then charge it to my account. That's a commercial term that Paul's using. He's being very legal here. And he's offering to make full payment restoration for everything that Philemon has done. How can Paul do that? He's in prison. How's he going to do that? How's he going to pay this debt back? Well, here's some of the suggestions. Some believe that he had funds. You know, before, earlier, when he appeared, much earlier, when Paul appeared before Felix, Felix wanted a bribe. It's like, hey, I can put you in prison, but if you pay me off, I know you've got some money out there. If you can pay me off, it's possible Paul had some funds. It's possible that Paul anticipated that he himself was going to be released and if he was released, then he could come back and do his tent-making job again and earn some money and say, I'll eventually, I'll make payments, I'll get it done eventually. And the main thing is, I think, I'm convinced, this was a sincere offer by Paul. If you're that offended, Philemon, by whatever loss you had at this, if this really is a hardship on you, then I'll make sure you get repaid for this. But this is a brother in Jesus now. Things are different today. <clears throat> Paul puts there, and again, this is probably for um, legal verification, but he says, I'm writing this with my own hand. You know, that's a bit unusual for Paul. We know he had some vision problems. He had scribes that would often write his letters for him. It's a good thing this is a short one. Because it's very likely, I think, that he wrote this entire note by hand. He put it on that postcard and gave it to Onesimus to take with him. And he says to Philemon, you owe me your very life. Philemon was eternally indebted to Paul. That's a very personal thing. In verse 20, he says, you owe me. It's a strong word. In the Greek, it's used elsewhere. Um, now you're doubly indebted to me, Philemon, because not only have I given you back a slave, but I'm the one who Philemon led you to Jesus. And you know Christ as Savior through the testimony that I have brought here. Paul was really confident that Philemon was going to do what was right. Do you think that? What did Paul expect? What was his expectations? Do you think he's hoping that Philemon will say, you know what, you're right, Onesimus was really, really valuable to you, and I should be there. Onesimus, go back to Rome and take care of Paul. I don't think that's what he was doing, because Paul was hoping to get released really soon. So by the time Onesimus got there and got back, Paul was thinking, oh, I'll be out of here by then. Don't worry about that. That's what I think. 
Did he think that he was going to release him as a slave and say, give him his freedom? Uh, not necessarily. I don't think that's what Paul was expecting. I don't think he anticipated that to happen. Was he expecting Onesimus to give him a warm welcome as though he was his very own brother in Christ? Yeah, that's what he was looking for. Receive this one. Welcome him into the fold. Uh, let him feel the grace and love that God can give through you. And remember, you owe me, Paul said, you owe me, do this. Can you imagine this? Onesimus, in one sense, he'll still be a slave. I'm not suggesting he's not. But in one sense, all of a sudden, he's as free as he's ever been in his life. The sin, the guilt, all is forgiven. And, and the one big conflict he has in his life with uh, Philemon is going to be cared for. He's going to be so free in his spirit, and yet Paul still sits in a prison. That's amazing. Martin Luther once said um, that we are all God's Onesimus. He says we are all in that position. That is exactly a picture of us. It's a picture of our lost condition and the divine grace that is given on our behalf. When Jesus Christ went to the cross, he did for us what we could never, ever do for ourselves. He, he took our place. The technical word is our sin was imputed upon him. It was all placed off of me onto Christ, and he took care of that. So I have forgiveness that I could never get except for the cross of Jesus Christ. I have that work that Christ did for me. I didn't do it for myself. My forgiveness doesn't come because of who I am or what potential I had or any of that stuff. None of that is worthy. It's what Christ did for me. And now we're accepted by the beloved. God's grace. It's so undeserved that he gives it to us. We have wronged our Lord, but he paid our debt anyhow. Now we can come to the Father and be welcomed because of what Jesus did. By the way, the end of the book does not tell us what you and I really want to know. We don't know what the outcome was. We don't know what Philemon did with Onesimus, but I can tell you that Philemon was pretty significant and this letter was preserved and circulated. So my guess is it probably ended pretty good. One of the early church writers, a guy named Ignatius, um, later on refers, you know, some decades later, a decade or two later, refers to an elder in the area of Ephesus by the name of Onesimus. Well, we don't know because that was a common name, but some people think it was this Onesimus that eventually pastored or eldered uh, some of the churches in Ephesus. What we do know is that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ frees us. Frees us in a way that nothing else can. Frees us in the only way that we need so desperately to get rid of the sin, to get rid of the guilt, to get rid of the shame, to get rid of the punishment that is due to us because of Christ, we bear it no more. Let's pray together. Father, how we thank you for the love and grace that you show to us for our Savior Jesus. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that even though we could never rescue ourselves, you met the need of our lives. Lord, I pray for each one today that their hearts would be in tune to you, that they would have experienced that freedom that comes in Christ alone. <coughs> and that they would know him as their Savior. Lord, if not, this is a day of great victory for them. May they come to you this day. Lord, all of us need you. We need you all the time. And we need to be dependent upon you and to trust you and to follow your need. Help us to stay close to you, to be in connection with your Holy Spirit, to be filled by him, to be guided and led in ways that will be pleasing in your sight. 
And may Jesus Christ be exalted and praised. Amen.